Hello Food Matters community, I'm back again and I am on my phone and I have a different internet connection and I hope that you are hearing me loud and clear. For those of you that have jumped over to this new live stream, uh, apologies for the poor internet connection previously. It was so wonderful to see all of your faces and where you're from. So much representation from British Columbia and from the US. Florida, Miami, and uh, one one person from Portugal, that was great. Okay, I see you're coming back online now here. Okay, good. You can hear me now, better quality. I was trying to use my laptop and another internet connection to try go to YouTube at the same time and a few other things, but that just didn't work and here we are. So we're gonna be talking about, in essence, how to eat to save your life. And we're gonna be talking about five keys to lasting energy, healing, and longevity and these are really the distillation of learnings and lessons that that i've i've been very fortunate to sit in front of and interview one-on-one -on -one, some of the brightest minds in nutrition health and natural medicine over the past 15 years uh, and it's great to see you all coming back online here again now awesome this is working and um you know and i i feel that it can be overwhelming when we think about what to eat or what not to eat and how many different diets are out there. And ultimately, I'm, I'm starting to see, as they say, you know, the forest through the trees, or I'm starting to see things a little bit differently now, and I'm starting to see trends. Because, you know, so many people speak about paleo or vegan or vegetarian or, 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 or high carb, low fat, and then it's high fat, no carbs, and then all these different approaches. And I think there's a few things that are interesting here. One is biochemical individuality is certainly a thing and age. So how old you are and how unique you are will give you a, a, a different perspective on what, what might be good for you or not. So, okay, everyone can hear me now. Deb writes nice background. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Florida, this is good news. This is working. Leeds, UK. Okay, we're on Toronto. Fantastic. So my, fir my first point that I want to get to today is on hydration. And, and I, I don't want to oversimplify this, it's just, just drink more water. I really want to talk to you about how important hydration is. And, and Nolene writes here, plant-based is the approach. And I can say, okay, but I would say hydration is, is, is so, so critical. Probably the first single most important thing we need to be focusing on is, is proper hydration. Why? Well, as a, as a body, as an entity, we are mostly water. We know that. And we are set circa 70% water and it is, it is a salty water solution. That's why if you're sick or unwell and you go into a hospital, they'll put a saline solution drip into your, into your blood. And that is essentially just putting more salty water back into your body. So we're walking around in this salty water package called a human body. And the earth, funnily enough, is also 70% water and it's salty water. And your body needs this salt water or this saline solution in order to thrive. If you look at blood under a microscope of a person that's dehydrated, of a person that is eating too many high acid foods or clogging foods, things like meat, dairy, etc., then you look at the cells and they're all clumped together, they're sticky and they're thick and they don't move very well. Now you look at the cells of somebody's blood under a microscope who's properly hydrated Nolene writes, plant-based is hydration. <laughs> Hell, it is. If you, look at a, if you look at cells under a microscope of this person, exemplar number two, then you will see that the cells don't clump together. They bounce off each other. They've got a nice electric charge around the outside that keeps them from clumping and lets them fro flow freely. Because we are energetic bodies as much as we are cellular, as much as we are bacteria. So we need to think about how to nourish our body on a cellular level. And cells need three things. And this was some early training I had in, my, in the beginning of my nutritional career. And that was cells need nutrients, they need uh, oxygen, and they need the ability to detoxify. And nutrients is a food discussion, we'll get to that. Oxygen, well, that's breath work and breathing and that is something that we all need to learn how to do properly and yoga can teach you that um, exercise can teach you that because it forces you to breathe 
But then the last thing is the ability to detoxify. And this is a really important point. Not only are we bathed in more toxins now than we ever have been as a species, but our bodies are less able to process toxins because we're so dehydrated. Hydration helps the body move things out. If you think of the primary elimination channels of the body, feces, urine, sweat, breath, that's it, I'm pretty sure. Those four. They're, they're moisture driven, they're hydration driven. So if you don't drink water, you don't pass stool. If you don't drink water, you don't pass urine. If you don't um, drink water, your breath, if you do that onto glasses or on a screen, you see that it fogs up, we eliminate through our breath as well. And our sweat, obviously when we sweat, it, it's, it's water based, so it comes out. So we use water as a way to eliminate toxins, to flush things out. It's like washing the dishes or cleaning your body. You use water to do that. And that happens systemically inside of our body too. So this story about hydration is not just drink a little bit of water or eat high water content foods. No, this is like such a critical, important step because toxins are, according to Charlotte Gerson and her father, Max Gerson, which was one of the leading proponents of, of natural medicine and natural therapies in the West, he says disease is, is driven by primarily two things, toxicity and deficiency. And it's funny, if you think about that in terms of how it relates to cells, cells needs oxygen, nutrients, and ability to detoxify. So Max Gerson says that toxicity and deficiency, not enough nutrients, cause disease. And that makes sense because of how it impacts immunity and, and, and so forth, and how toxins impact the body. So hydration is so important in order to help us maintain a healthy equilibrium in terms of detoxification, plus it also it helps with so many other systemic functions in the body. Problem, most people wake up in the morning, they have coffee, and then they have cereal or toast or bread, and this creates, okay, here comes a storm, this creates a, a diuretic effect on the body. It's sucking more water out of the body. And so what we need to consider here is especially at that first start of the day is to start to drink more water or and eat high water content foods. So consuming more fruits, consuming more vegetables. These have enormous amounts of water in them. I mean, lettuce is 90, 99, 97% water, cucumbers, watermelon, spinach. These foods are high water content foods. You're essentially eating water and it's actually nature's filtered water. If you're concerned about tap water, or if you're concerned about what water filter should I use, eat fruit, eat vegetables. They're filtered by nature. Now, organic, of course, because if you're spraying toxic chemicals onto a fruit or a vegetable, you're not really serving the purpose of supporting your body with clean hydration and water. But essentially water in fruit or in a coconut for that matter is filtered by nature. So you want to look at introducing more hydration on a consistent basis to your life and being very clued in to your body in terms of are you experiencing dehydration symptoms? For instance, is your urine too yellow? Okay, maybe if you've had some B vitamins that would make sense, but if not, if it is, then you need to drink more water. Do you feel foggy? Does your skin feel dry and flaky or itchy? Are your lips dry? They're really important signs that you need to drink more water or eat more water, high water content foods, or as one of the, the uh, attendees here said earlier, eat more plant-based foods which have a lot of water in them, which is true. Just doing a quick check in here. Can you hear me okay? Give me a quick comment here because I haven't seen a comment for a few minutes. <clears throat> I'd love to hear from you before I get onto this next point. I'm just gonna type that to can you hear me okay? So, first point is hydration. Second point, this is really a food to avoid and we speak a little bit about this in the Total Wellness Summit coming up this weekend. And this is about modern wheat. We have, through the advent of civilization, mastered the domestication of certain animals and plant species. And I would say master, but it's probably an incorrect statement because I think we're still learning a lot about the implications of, of domestication, hybridization, genetic modification, etc. And anytime you hybridize, domesticate, or 
change something, you're creating a chain of effects that you may not have any idea what that could look like. For instance, we have a small puppy dog here and it is a chihuahua. Now, the chihuahua is a descendant of a grey wolf and Daniel Vitalis has taught, taught me this. Now, you take the runt of a grey wolf litter with the runt of another grey wolf litter and then you keep doing that over and over and over again until you get these particular genetic traits that you're looking for. Now, what happens when you do that, you change that animal and they become more susceptible to illness or disease for that matter, or you change the genetic makeup of it. We've done that with wheat and we've changed wheat in a way that has supported industrial agriculture. However, it has come at a cost to human health. So I, I just commented, can you hear me? And I haven't seen a comment since then. I got one like on it, but I'd love to just hear from you because I do not know if this is still working, but I assume that it is. Okay, and modern wheat, the modification of modern wheat predates a lot of genetic modified technology and they were using gene technology that was more experimental and they ended up over time creating this semi-dwarf modern wheat variety which is useful in modern combine harvesting agricultural practices because it's a shorter wheat and so the big machine that comes and picks it up it's easier for it to do that. However this wheat with the research that's followed in, in, in the decades past and has caused a, a, a massive amount of aggra aggravation to the gut. And this is leading to the breakdown in the gut wall. And the, and the gut is the center of our immunity. The gut is the center of our power. I still haven't seen any comments here for a while. I'm just gonna check on everything here. I saw all your comments before and now I don't see them. but I assume we're still good. So I'm gonna keep going. Maybe it's just my comments have stalled. And this type of wheat is causing a breakdown in a gut wall. And this means that macro particles that are not really designed to be in the bloodstream are making their way into the bloodstream. Genetically modified foods also cause breakdown in the gut wall. Too much stress does. Also fried foods and also certain food um, additives can and, and sugar, excess sugar consumption in particular actually is, is one of the key contributors to breaking down the gut wall. Now, the gut or the navel center is a center of power in the East. Think about yogic traditions or traditional Chinese medicine. They talk about the gut as the center of power. Um, and some, you know, in the nutritional world, we talk about the gut as the center and the seat of our immunity. And they say that up to 60% of our immunity resides in our gut. And that if we're concerned about chronic degenerative disease, or if we're concerned about a virus, or if we're concerned about constantly getting sick, we need to be concerned about the gut. This is the big, big, big discussion of our time. And so we need to be most concerned about what causes the most stress or the biggest breakdowns to the gut wall. And that is modern industrialized wheat. And not only because of the way that it's genetically modified and manipulated and the fact that it was done at a time predating a lot of modern genetically modified technology, but also because they use a lot of toxic chemicals in the production of modern wheat. And they spray wheat with glyphosate, which is now a known possible carcinogen, according to the World Health Organization, in that it may cause cancer. That they spray it during the growing process, but just before they harvest it, they spray it with glyphosate as a desiccant to dry the crop out so that it's easier to handle when they harvest it and it's less susceptible to mold and, and other toxins. So we're essentially consuming a toxic modified grain. And the problem is, is that this modern wheat is making its way into so many different processed foods. And so moving towards a diet that reduces reliance on modern, domesticated, non-organic wheat is important. So learning how to use alternative grains, pseudo grains, uh, and relying more on or maybe roots and tubers as a, as a basis 
for the diet as opposed to just turning to a sandwich or bread or toast or cereal is going to be hypercritical uh, and is one of these key five steps for consideration. So to re recap, first one, hydration. Second one is, is avoiding modern domesticated wheat. Now, if you're trying to explore different eating methodologies or trying to go gluten-free, at Food Matters, we have lots of resources for you. We're kicking off a, a clean eating program, Start Together, Finish Together, April 5. Um, and we're also, up until that date, running a 10-day free event, Total Wellness Summit, uh, which you can find it in a link in the, in the comments here. So I encourage you to sign up to this free event. Learn, from, learn more about some of these topics I'm talking about today with some of the key speakers throughout this event. And then, if you want to implement more of this knowledge, you're welcome to come and join us for our clean eating program, April 5. It kicks off. One of the alternatives that I'm using here a lot in Vanuatu is man, uh, manioc, and it's called cassava. I'm actually just trying to look for one now. I, I don't have one here. I've got one growing in the garden, but it's a root vegetable, and you can gr uh, rasp it up or grate it and create like a pudding type thing to make like a, a bread, or you can make a flour with it and I've been using that as a flour and it's an amazing flour. It seems to be almost a straight one for one replacement with wheat flour and it makes the most incredible pancakes. So manioc or cassava flour is a key go-to for me. Okay, third step for lasting health, energy, healing and vitality and longevity is eat fat from nature not from a bottle. Now, fat has gone through lots of different phases of uh, popularity and, and lack thereof. In the 80s, it was super unpopular and it was all about high carb, low fat. And now it's swung more back to this, well, we need high fat and there's cultures that live around the world that have lots of fat in their diet and they thrive. And we're stuck in between these two worlds. And I feel like what living in Vanuatu here has done for me and also one of the interviews that I did during this summit was with Cyrus Kambata and Robbie Barbaro and they are talking about research around fat and insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance and diabetes and there are certain types of fat that inhibit your body's ability to break down sugar circulating in the bloodstream or stored in the adipose. So if you suffer from obesity or you often put on weight easily or you have lots of mood swings or brain fog and sugar highs and lows or you're suffering from diabetes and this is a big swathe of the population that fits into these buckets, you're potentially eating fat from a bottle or from processed foods and not from whole foods. And so hydrogenated fats obviously the big key no goes ever 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 it's not even a food ants don't even eat it this is margarine this is these shortenings that are solidified oils the problem is is that oh yeah it's easy to say in this community we don't eat margarine however hydrogenated oils have made their way into an, in a, into a myriad of, of of processed foods in the supermarkets these days and from muffins to cakes to cake mixes to snack bars to so many things and and it's it's proliferated and i think it helps with the stability of a product helps with taste because people love fat fat salt sugar this is what we're really designed to to, to crave and so removing hydrogenated fats from your diet is hypercritical because of how it impacts the body's ability to break down sugar now there's other types of fats too, which sort of sit on this, are they okay, are they not okay? You know, coconut oils is an amazing healthy fat and everyone says that it's great. <clears throat> and I agree, coconut oil is great. Olive oil, <clears throat> other oils. I think some of the vegetable oils are, are move, for me, definitely moving into that no-go category. Um, canola oil, sunflower, safflower, etc. Be because of the way that they're quite unstable and they go rancid quite quickly. And if you think about, one of the other big trends that should stay and that has stayed is about antioxidants, eating more antioxidants. What are antioxidants? Well, they're plant-based chemicals, phytochemicals in foods, typically that give foods color. 
so the blue around the blueberries, the red around the grapes, the red and red wine, um, the, 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 the color that gives cr krill have that color, so that's why krill sometimes fall into this, this, this category, or, or certain types of um, other plants and or animals that give off color. Color is a, is a sign of phytochemicals, and phytochemicals, or these plant-based chemicals, are, are, are these sort of antioxidants. They fight free radical damage. Now, free radical damage is often caused by rancid fats oxidized fats so things that are deep fried or that have been or, or trans fats that have been cooked at high temperatures typically using these vegetable oils these golden type vegetable oils that you see all throughout the supermarkets now there are healthier oils out there and healthier fats things like olive oil extra virgin cold pressed olive oil or some coconut oil or even butter and even people that are don't do well on dairy and I don't necessarily recommend dairy to anybody they can do okay on butter because it has less lactase, lactose, and it's typically cultured or fermented in some way, shape, or form, and it's easier to digest. And you, if you're using a small amount, I, I see that as fitting into an okay category. However, there's still one problem here: is that anthropologically speaking, as a species, we never really concentrated vast amounts of oil into receptacles such as glass jars and put them into our little bush kitchens and, and consumed cups of them or teaspoons of them or tablespoons of them a day. No, we achieved healthy fat intake by eating whole foods. So instead of, and, and look, there are, in our modern food landscape, there are times we need oil. If you want to cook a little bit or if you want to add something to a dressing or a salad, I think it's about using very small amounts of these oils that are in a liquid bottled form and trying to get more of your fats from the whole food form. For instance, instead of using all this olive oil everywhere, eat more olives. Because when you eat a whole food compared to some extracted version of it, there's just these magical things that happen. And we know this to be true. It's like if you make a juice. Juicing can be super healthy and unhealthy. If you just juice five apples, two oranges, and a little bit of ginger, don't think that that's healthy. You're just taking all the fiber out, and you're extracting the sugar, the liquid sugar, and that's going to be a sugar bomb for your body. Whereas if you eat the apple, you're getting a fiber too. But then juicing can play a really powerful part if you're trying to extract alkaline nutrients and minerals in a liquid form from greens, then that's a really powerful way because we know that's just the double down on the positivity as opposed to a double down on the sort of negativity of too much sugar. So taking this filter or approach of living in the wilderness or in your natural habitat. So try think about where would your natural habitat be. For me, my last name is Colhoun. Uh, my father is of Scottish descent. My mother's of Irish descent. And so I've got some sort of history of that northern uh, United Kingdom sort of area. So what do those people do and how do they live and eat on a, on a regular basis? What do we know about them as, as a species? And what do we know about European cultures generally as a species, or African cultures, or Asian cultures, or Melanesian, or Polynesian? And if we start to interweave all these things together, we start to go, well, what, what were some of their fat sources? So for instance, here I'm in, I'm in Melanesia, in the Pacific. Their primary fat source is coconut. They get that fat from eating the coconut, not from buying coconut oil at a store. In the West, we're like, oh, they're healthy, coconut oil's healthy, let's extract the oil, put it in these huge bottles, put it in smoothies, drink it down, and have these enormous amounts of it. And I feel like what the research is saying, and then what anthropologically is being shown to us, is that we've never consumed vast amounts of oil. And now we're cooking in it, we're deep frying in it, all our processed foods are made in it, so we're just simply getting too much oil from not a whole source, or fat from not a whole source. And I don't necessarily think fat's bad. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that any of these sort of proponents of fat are wrong. We need fat. Fat is a critical driver of and supporting hormones, which is the exchange of information and chemicals in the body, supporting metabolism, reducing our, our, our hunger. So it's super critical. So fat is so important eating it from a whole food source as opposed to a bottled oil. And if you're going to a bottled oil or some sort of oil to cook with or use on a regular basis, use an olive, extra virgin, 
or a butter, or a ghee, or a coconut. Or a little bit of a mix of both. If you're using a bit of olive butter and you don't want it to burn, put a bit of coconut oil or olive oil in there and it stops the butter from burning. So there's little ways you can do. <clears throat> They're approved, at least on the safe list, for small amounts. But then you want most of your fat to be coming from your food. Nuts, seeds, avocados. Um, some animal products too have fat in them, of course. And I think when it comes to animal products, John Robbins is probably one of your key guides in terms of which ones should I eat if you choose to eat any animal, any products whatsoever. And I interviewed on, on, him on this topic just the other day. It's going to be going live in the Total Wellness Summit this weekend. And you can register for that at foodmatters.com forward slash TWS. In this interview, he talks about certain types of fish, but his key comment is really eat lower down the food chain. And for a lot of reasons, he says that because they concentrate less toxins. <clears throat> you think about a tuna versus an anchovy. A tuna is, has got mercury in it at higher levels and anchovy does not. Uh, same with animals. You think about a, a cow or you think about an insect, like a cricket. Uh, so we, we need to think about that because we have so many more toxins circulating in our environment today and toxins are lipophilic. They're fat loving, so they store with fat. So things like even almonds or butter or avocado or other things you want to try and make sure they're organic as possible. Now, avocado is a bit of an outlier because it's got a hard skin and you, you crack it open, you just eat the inside, and sprays typically don't go inside that. That's why it's on the clean 15. But if you think about animal products, you definitely want to make sure they're as clean as possible and as small as possible and as wild as possible. I think they're the key focal points here, and many indigenous cultures do achieve some of their fat intake from these smaller wild animals on an infrequent basis. They are mostly plant eaters unless you get into the extreme northern or southern latitudes where you have, or northern should I say, only where you have cultures that exist primarily on animal products. So that is my third point. Eat fat, but not too much. Don't drink it. Don't take it from bottles of oil and extracted oils. Try to think about if you were an indigenous person living in your community, would you go extract hundreds of coconuts and scrape them out and squeeze the oil out? But no, would you go and harvest thousands of olives and squeeze the olive oil? Not really, so just use that very sparingly, but try eat your fat in a whole source, whole food form. Okay, that's third point. Fourth point, this is a to avoid as well, and I typically don't love doing to avoid lists. I like doing eat more of these lists, but I feel like this is an important one to avoid because of the fact that we have manipulated this product significantly in the past few decades and it's something that's causing a lot of detrimental health effects and many people are already onto this and I, I, I would assume that in this community many people are already not eating this product but it's mainstream conventional dairy and dairy is an interesting product. If, if for instance I was living in a northern latitude, such as Switzerland, for instance, hypothetically. And over generations, there was these deep, cold, hard winters. And it was, there was no sunlight. And I needed, at that point, and I know in retrospective, looking at that, I know what that person would need, there was such, that they would need more vitamin D. Because vitamin D is, is, a, is a hormone-like vitamin and it is achieved through getting exposure to sunlight in summer and or certain types of food products. And so if I'm low on vitamin D, which can cause seasonal affective disorder or sadness, SAD, um, then <clears throat> you need to get that from your food or from the sun. And the sun, when you stand in the sun, the sun actually penetrates your skin, it goes through the transdermal layer and then converts freely circulating and perfectly normal to be circulating cholesterol in your bloodstream into this vitamin-like hormone, vitamin D. And we know that vitamin D is so, so important for preventing against viruses, even coronavirus for that matter. And we know a lot of people are, are, are recommending vitamin D supplementation, but it's like, well, no, how did we do vitamin D back in the day? We got sunlight, we got outdoors more, we're indoors less, and we ate certain foods that had higher concentrations of vitamin D in climates where that wasn't possible. So extreme northern latitudes where it's really cold, dairy or the milk of this animal 
was a concentrated form of sunlight because the sun comes down and grows the grass, the grass is a concentrated form of sunlight, chlorophyll, that animal eats that sunlight, it has four stomachs, converts it, and it has vitamin D in it. Now that's where I feel like it would be okay to have some raw, organic, natural dairy in your life and still not take that mother away from its calf. But it still doesn't really make sense, it's all like an emergency food, because that's the milk of another species, and that's not really designed for humans. But then the big problem is, and I think even like a little bit of raw goat's milk or camel milk or whatever, yes, okay, it's the milk of another species, doesn't make sense, no, not at all. Could it be an emergency food, just like stealing an egg out of the nest of a bird be an emergency food? Or Of course. Should it be a staple and be the first thing we put on our modern domesticated wheat in the morning? No, no. But it's become that because it's fatty and we like fat. We are trained as a species, indigenously, through our genetics, to look for fat and sugar. And that's why fast food companies do so well in the West, because they prey on that ancient craving of needing that, because fat and sugar are quite rare in the environment. And if you're out walking around in the forest here, I mean, sugar's a little bit less rare, a fat, but they're still rare. I mean, I have to get a coconut to get fat, or I have to get a fruit to get some sugar. So we're wired to be looking for that. And even when I go to some of the outer islands here and I spend time with the indigenous people here, the Nivinawatu people, you walk around with a knife and you find these types of foods and that's what you're sort of doing mostly. You're concerning yourself with gathering food and small amounts of hunting, but mostly gathering plants, vegetables, nuts, seeds, tubers, roots, herbs, mushrooms, etc. Now, we are stocking our supermarkets in the US with these gallon bottles, these huge big bottles of like conventional dairy. These cows are having their young taken away from them and then they're locked inside and they're not allowed outside in many instances. Then they become sick, obviously, and they're probably pretty sad that they lost their offspring. Then they're put on antibiotics because they're sick. And then once the milk is made from this sick enslaved animal which is producing mucus and all sorts of other things because of its illness then we pasteurize it because it's dangerous and then we homogenize it which is sort of making the fat change molecular shape to sort of make sure it doesn't float on top and then we drink it and this is the strangest thing ever really to be honest and I think even the domestication of animals without a reverence for collaboration is the strangest thing ever. So if you think about animal-human bonds, they've existed throughout millennia, and they've been quite collabor they've been quite collaborative. Uh, think about a dog, for instance. Like a dog, you can develop a pair bond with a dog, as you'll be the alpha male, the leader of the pack, the master, whatever, and the dog will, will be there, and they understand that dynamic. But you serve each other, you support each other. The dog will provide protection or companionship and you support that collaborative environment relationship with love and affection and food. I often call <clears throat> my dog, I'm his primary meat supplier and everybody else, he just protects me because of that. Maybe it is that simple, uh, but the dogs do eat meat, they're not, they're not vegetarians, so I serve my dog meat. <clears throat> so, but we've become very uncollaborative in our environment, in our relationship with animals in more recent history. And if you're in a small scale farm, you'll understand the importance of collaboration. Or if you're a biodynamic farmer, you understand that you need cow dung in order to make great manure and you need cows in order to, to help facilitate that fertilization process and animals are a big part of sustainable or regenerative agricultural practices. Problem, we've now switched over to a very intensive form of agricultural practice called factory farming and this there is no it's a one-way street it's basically all about profit and it's all about producing massive amounts of food at the lowest cost possible without any collaborative relationship with these animals. And you look at stockyards where they're doing feedlots or you look at where they've got chickens or, or anything and it's just not right. It's absolutely not right. It's not natural. And the same goes for dairy. And dairy is just modern slavery of animals and we need to stop supporting that. And I feel like if you want to collaborate with local farmers, in, a, in, a, in a, like a raw milk environment, if that's allowed. I think there was, some, there was a big controversy over that in the US for a while. Or um, just 
local small scale providers where you understand that there's more of that collaborative process and there's the respect and, and, and it's ethical, I think, okay, you know, but it's still not really a food for humans. But some people do do better. If you're Northern Latitude descendants, then you've got a better capability to digest that, particularly if it's fermented. And then um, after that, oh, Ali just wrote, is it just me or others having him freeze up again? You let me know, guys. I need to know if I'm freezing. Then you look at the Asian culture. They never really had cows for thousands of years, and they don't have really a good ability to break down lactose or lactase. So for consideration, guys, I really think this is a massive, massive, massive big chink in the armor in terms of the, 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 the development of the human species. And John Robbins talks about this too quite a bit in, uh, thanks guys for your comments, I can, I can hear you seeing it now. John Robbins talks about this quite a bit in this interview I just did with him for this Total Wellness Summit. And he basically left a billion dollar inheritance um, with Baskin Robbins to, to, because of this issue, you know, his father was putting up pictures of these dairy cows grazing on these big green acres and then he went to the farm where they were getting the milk from to make the ice cream at Baskin Robbins and it was a factory farm and it was horrible. And so we, thanks for your comments guys, I, I can hear Daphine from Mexico says she can hear me, that's great, thank you Sue. And so this is a big, big problem and we need to eliminate this product as much as possible or be very collaborative and cautious and, and conscious about how we do that. Small amounts of butter I consume, trying to get the best quality possible, um, trying to, if you don't do great on dairy, eliminating that and or trying other types of milks. And there's so many types of milks out there at the moment, so that, that's great. I've been making homemade coconut milk a lot lately where you take a old coconut and you rasp it up and you end up with these shells. Here, I've got some here. And these you can use to drink a local beverage here called kava. And it's a root vegetable that they grind up and they mix with water and you drink it down and it makes you very calm. It's an end of the day drink. So you can make coconut milk and then make a shell. And so that's my fourth point. So I'm gonna recap here. Point number one, hydration. Not just a simple drink more water. This is a corner stay. Someone said drums, Lindsay. This is a corner stay of a healthy life is eating more high water content foods, drinking more water and really focusing on having more vegetables as part of your diet and fruits because that will assist in supporting cellular health, in particular that one point about detoxification. The second point was modern wheat, eliminating or removing as much of that as possible and getting comfortable and familiar with um, pseudo grains and other types, of, um, other types of grains and seeds. And I think that is a really, really, really important point to consider and and familiar with things like manioc or cassava other root vegetables that can be used as a, as a as an alternative flour and we highlight many of these in our clean eating program uh, which is coming up april 5 start together finish together and um, you can find out more about that at foodmatters.com and that's point two point three eating fat definitely but more whole fats from nature and less bottled oils and if you're going to use any bottle oils trying to eliminate them down to just olive coconut and butter which is not really about or ghee and that makes it it's a simple skin and then anything else is a no but really look for hydrogenated oils in your processed foods and look out for the vegetable oils canola oil safo oil, etc in processed processed foods or deep fried foods these are a really big impediment to health fourth is modern dairy really bringing that back. Nut butters are okay, sure, I'm okay with that. Spelt flour, is it okay? Spelt is a more ancient wheat. I'm not so bad with it. The other thing we need to consider with wheat or breads or anything is, is how do we process it? And if it's soaked and fermented and then made into a bread, that's much better. Fermentation always helps with everything. And, <clears throat> but I would be still, if you have, I would be taking a period of time of your life and eliminating gluten and wheat and most grains, not all of them, like some, some ones are a bit more subtle on the body, quinoa, buckwheat, millet, etc. 
but the wheat type, avoiding that for maybe 21 days or more, that's, we've got a 21 day plan to help you do that. And then reset your body and reapproach your relationship with some of these foods. Do I need bread? Do I feel like it? What do I feel like after I have spelt now? Okay, okay. Ooh, not so good. Okay, well I don't do bread anymore. Maybe I just cut up a bit of potato, rasp a bit of potato and make a little rosti in a pan and put something on that. You know, becoming, or do a little buckwheat thing. So, that's modern wheat, fat from nature, modern dairy. Okay, I'm gonna go to the fifth point or last point here. I'm gonna answer some questions here. Avocado keeps coming up here, a few questions. What about avocado oil? So Mary, look, it's a pretty stable oil. You, you can cook with it. I see a few people speaking about that. I don't mind it, uh, but I, I, I would say it could, go, it could make it on that list as well. I just think the thing here is that I want to make sure that when you're in your life, in your kitchen, based on all the research, that we should be thinking about, okay, what if I'm in, the, in nature, in the bush, would I have or would I make avocado oil? No. Would I harvest an avocado and eat it if it was ripe? Yeah, of course. So we need to think about that a little bit. I know olive oil, I'm saying it's okay, and maybe that's why avocado oil is okay, but I'm just, I'm probably more concerned about volume than I am, and I'm concerned about quality. So quality of olive, grass-fed butter or ghee, coconut, sure, let's put avocado in there, but I don't want you to think that I'm saying have these oils, put them into smoothies, put them everywhere, use so much. I agree, fat is important. We need quite a bit in our diet, but to get it from a whole food source is, is, is the, the, the best. Because it fits also, you have to take a nutritional science perspective than an anthropological perspective. And if, if, if you don't spend much time around indigenous people, it might be hard to imagine that. If you do, and I'm lucky to here in Vanuatu, it's quickly really realize that, wow, what, what are we doing? Why have we done all this stuff? Why have we made all these products? It doesn't make any sense. We've done it because of convenience. Convenience is killing us people. That is the absolute truth. The microwave, it's so convenient, killing us, killing our food. We need to be careful of convenience. Pharmaceutical medication for conditions that are caused by our laziness or our lack of attention to being human, i.e. rest, sunshine, outdoors, walking barefoot, diseases caused by, or, illness, or conditions caused by that being handled with a pill because of convenience is no good. If you've got a headache and you haven't tried meditation, drinking water, being outside, eating pure foods, then you're, you're not really concerned with getting rid of it and you, sh you shouldn't be taking a pill. Okay. Um, so what type of olive oil? Cold, Magdalene writes, cold pressed extra virgin olive oil. Uh, how do I teach kids? What can I tell them? Poor city families, the children teach parents access. What can they do? I'd say teach them about fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds and how to appreciate a wide variety of foods. One of the things that, and I'm going to get to the fifth point, don't worry. One of the things that Daniel Vitalis talks about in this interview on how to use food as medicine coming up in Total Wellness Summit this weekend is about broadening the spectrum of foods that we eat. And most people eat nuts and seeds and like, oh yeah, I like Brazil nuts and walnuts. And that's all they eat. Well, it's like, no, go eat pepitas, or pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, hemp seeds, um, chia seeds, flax seeds, diversity people. You know, we've become a species that used to eat hundreds of different types of foods down to 30 to 50. and also, when you wrap this anthropological knowledge of spending time with indigenous people over it, you, st you go to the bush and there's, wow, there's like 30 different types of nuts here in the forest. Look, there's all, you know, there's just this variety. And when you have variety, you're getting all these subtle nutrients and different influences from these different foods, as opposed to just being this one track horse. You wake up, you have bread, you put this on it, you go out, you have a salad, which just has romaine lettuce and one dressing, and then you have this and this. And, you're missing the point. You want to be having different types of leaves, different types of seeds, different types of grains, different types of or grain-like seeds or pseudo grains, and really broadening that spectrum of food that you're eating. So, okay, whew, here we go. Coming to the last point, and I'll get to some more Q and A at the end here. Uh, so Nicole writes, that's such a deeper issue than just the knowledge of how to affordability, availability, preservation and culture, 100%. But really, 
if you think about affordability, availability and preservation, you have to look at beans and lentils as well. And look, do I recommend having that as the main part of a diet? No. Do I think that having some beans and lentils as part of a diet is healthy? Yes. Is there a lot of research showing that they can be healthy? Yes. Are they cheap? Yes. Are they easily preserved and stored? Yes, 100%. They're just dried goods sitting there. And so you can take beans or legumes or lentils, soak them. You must soak them for 8, 12, 24 hours overnight, ideally, more. Rinse the water out a few times, then cook them properly. Cook, 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 and you'll have less issues with them. People have sometimes issues with them. They're not prepared properly, or if they eat them from a shop, they're not prepared properly. So that's something that's affordable, cheap, healthy, available, and mind-blowing when you know how to prepare it properly. Like, I have a lentil curry, and there's a lentil curry recipe, a coconut lentil curry recipe, in the Total Wellness Summit with a video for you free coming up this weekend, and it incorporates all these medicinal spices, all these healing spices, and the fat from the coconut milk as well, and these lentils, and it's cheap. It's cheap food, and it tastes freaking amazing, and it's vegetarian, plant-based. So, that's just a point there, because I know these are the biggest things people come back, oh, it's expensive to eat healthy. Well, no, actually, bullshit. Excuse me. Oh, oh. Or, or it can be expensive to eat healthy. If you go to health food stores or Whole Foods, Whole Paycheck, it can be very expensive to eat healthy. However, it's not clean cut statement. If you go to farmers markets and you collaborate with CSAs or community supported agricultural groups, you will be able to find very, very cheap, affordable foods that do. Mary writes, I do a coconut milk with tons of spices and chickpeas. Yes. Nicole's hungry. What about rice? I don't mind rice. I don't eat too much of it. And I think that, again, let's put an anthropological spin on this. First of all, it's Asian. Am I Asian? No. So it's probably not my, my key thing. I'm more European, so probably more oats is my key thing. I don't strive on oats, thrive on oats as, as much. So I'm doing more oats now than I have done, and I'm okay with it. I'm okay with oats, but sometimes I notice I'm not so good on it. And rice, I'm okay with rice in small amounts. I see definitely developing countries using excess amounts of rice as a, as a, as a base, and in combined with poor quality fat, vegetable oil, it's a recipe for disaster. It's like I spoke about the vegetable oils, these poor quality vegetable oils, in, and, the, and the hydrogenated fats and the trans fats, which is fried food, cheap food, processed food, margarines, and the cheap oils that people cook with typically, inhibit the body's ability to break down sugar. And so sugar is in the form of sugar, sugary drinks, etc but it's also in the form of carbohydrates, bread, pastas, cookies, cakes, and rice. So if you've got bad quality fats, too much carbs, big belly, obesity, diabetes, poor circulation, loss of legs, loss of eyesight, macular degeneration, da da da, death. So, whoa, serious issue. And uh, if you love rice, Anita, that's okay. Don't, well look, I can't speak to you. I can only speak to what I know. I like rice too. But I know that if anthropologically speaking, if I go out into a field to harvest rice, I don't know, have you ever done this, Anita? Enlighten me. I haven't. I've seen rice paddies before. But it takes time and effort, and it's a lot of work. And it's the same with wheat. If I had a wheat field out there and I wanted to go make a loaf of bread, let's be honest about how much time that's going to take me, one person, or two people, right? <laughs> Lindsay's just laughing. Go out there, harvest the wheat shake it all off, get the print, grind it down, stone grind it, then like do all these things and then add the water and then salt and yeast and let it sit there and then put it in the oven and make a loaf of bread. That's a lot of work that goes into that. The practicality of that is very low. Nature didn't design us to make bread, that's all I'm saying. Now we make bread, we make things of it, but it's a hard amount of work. And so therefore, it should be a very small part of our diet because if we had to think about if I did that myself, it would be very labor intensive as opposed to grabbing a nut or a seed or a fruit from a tree or an avocado and eating it. Same goes for rice. Harvesting rice is a lot of work and it probably means that we should only have small amounts of it, but with cheap labor and mechanized industrial agriculture, we've created an environment where it's cheaper to produce large amounts of these types of grains so it's not not 
great. Uh, okay, anthropologically affects mixed race. Look, I think just maybe think more <clears throat> about, then the other filter over the top of that is locality. Where do you live now? So that's one thing. Um, and what season is it? But then, yeah, trying to take, pay some homage to your, I think there's a lot of things going on here. You know, you have to think about what's my genetic lineage in terms of DNA? What is my current location where do i live and what food do i have access to and what do i know about how food makes me heal and do i have any conditions or illnesses that i need to focus on which would impact those choices so there are some interesting points to consider and i think they all start overlapping but then the other thing is try to spend more time with indigenous cultures look at how they approach food you know and and indigenous culture is hard to get back to because most indigenous cultures around the world have been impacted by modernization, westernization. And that is a big issue. And but if you go to real indigenous people, they're not really doing many of these things that we think are standard foods. They're not really doing milk. They're not really doing bread. They're not really doing these things. They might be making small things like corn patties or little things, occasional little things they make. Like, yes, in Mexico, they make corn. Yes, it's a seed of a grass wild corns and crazy different colored corns things like that are great but then we've genetically modified so much corn it's such an issue mary goat milk and yogurt okay goats close to human if you want to eat or drink the milk of another species or an animal that's a considered okay thing gandhi carried a goat with him if that if that means anything for you he was a vegetarian but he had a goat yogurt is fermented dairy i think that if you're having any types of dairy the first thing should be try to make sure it's the best quality possible grass-fed pasture raised, organic, free range outdoor, ethical animals. Second is try to get animals that produce milk closer to human milk, goat. Third thing, make sure it's fermented where possible. That puts you into the category of kefirs and yogurts. And the final thing is make sure it's raw if possible. So it's still got the living part of it. So, but then again, it's still the species, it's still the milk of another species and not really ideal. Coconut yogurt, yes, I'm okay with that. Um, okay, last point here, fifth point on how to eat for lasting health, energy, and vitality, and that is to bring a sense of mindfulness to how you eat food. In the West, in particular in America, and I hate this, this is an absolute pet hate of mine, and it irks me to no end when I'm in a restaurant in the US, and I've got my plate there and there's a little bit of food left there and I'm slowly getting through my food. And of course, sometimes I eat fast and I'm not proud of that. If I'm really hungry, I might, I might do that. Most of the time I like to approach my food with calm and ease. And the waiter will come up and say, are you still working on that? And I can't believe that they use these words, working and food. Eating food is not work. Eating food is supreme pleasure and joy and we've made it work. We eat on our way to work. We eat while we're working. And even at restaurants, waiters ask, are you working on that? I mean, it is surreal that this language is even associated with food. And it tells me, and it speaks to the neurosis that we're suffering from in the West, in that food has become quick work, get it in there, put all your food in there, get your nutrients, top up, and then off you go. And it's like, no, wait, no, 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 stop. Food is, a uh, a supremely unique act. You think about it, we have to eat and we have to sleep. That, they're weird and we sleep a dizzying amount of time, most people, and food we need to eat. So these should be very, they should be approached with reverence. These are, these are core aspects of being human. And to eat mindfully, I think, takes a few steps that you can approach to eat. How do I, how do I respond, rise Heather? <laughs> oh, different ways sometimes. Sometimes I get upset. I'll, I'll tell them my little rant. I say, I never work on food. I'm always eating in a calm state. Thank you very much. Sometimes I, I just can't even go there because it's so built into the vernacular of, of the American world. You know, people are working on every, everything. So there's a few processes you can do to, to bring more mindfulness to the way you eat. First one's don't eat when you're driving if you can avoid it. Don't eat when you're working at your desk if you can avoid it. And don't eat while you're walking around. I remember there was, um, I remember there was some 
lady who was in France and she was sitting down with a French woman and they were looking at two girls walking and they were both eating while they were walking and the French lady said, oh, they must be American and the French lady said, why, well, and the other lady said, well, why, well, how do you know that they're, they're, Amer they're American? Oh, they're walking while they eat. I was like, oh my God, oh my God. Um, powerful observation, I love these sort of powerful observations. It just really changes your perspective of the world. And so don't walk while you eat because you can't, there's two systems that your body operates in, parasympathetic and sympathetic. And one is about fight or flight and the other one is about rest, digest, repair. And so you need to be in that state of rest, digest, repair, which is that calm state in order to be able to properly extract nutrients from food and digest food. How do you do that? Take a few deep breaths before you eat, sit down in a calm space, turn the news off. Death, pain, fire, destruction does not live on my plate. Terrorism and coronavirus for that matter. Then also smell your food. The olfactory system is so powerful, it is a precursor to digestion. When you smell good food, you start to salivate. Salivation is the beginning of the digestion process because it starts breaking down the food as it goes into your mouth. Then the next thing you can do is you can bless your food. This is something that I do. I typically, or say a prayer. And your prayer could be to a God, it could be to Jesus, it could be to Buddha, it could be to Lakshmi, it could be to a guru, it could just be to your farmer. It could just be for the gratitude of existing. And I typically hold my hands out and I say, thank you for this beautiful food. Thank you for this nourishment. Thank you for all the farmers and the people and the love that have gone into creating this food. And then I just will sometimes go off and thank you for the opportunity I even have to exist. What a miracle. And you move into this state of peace, calm and then your body's ready to eat you're ready to digest and it can, if you're real quick and honestly I get busy sometimes of course I do if I'm busy and I was stressed out today because the stream didn't work and everything but if I'm going to approach some food I'll just stop and I'll just start eating and on the plane people think I'm weird holding my hands over food but also if you think about food as water here we go I'm back and what happens is if somebody's been making food in a restaurant where they're yelling or screaming like Gordon Ramsay, or they're stressed out and they're putting all that energy into the food or they killed animals that were stressed and unhealthy and oh, da, da, there's all this terror and energy, the bad energy that could have gone into food and it comes out and you just see the food on the plate. But energetically, food carries energy, I believe. Water carries energy. We carry energy. If you yell and scream at somebody, you're affecting the water in their body. So. <laughs> I thank the chef at the quarantine hotel, I love it. So taking that time to just say thank you for this beautiful food, I give it loving, healing, energy and peace and calm and, and just taking that time, there's so many things that this does. One is it puts you in a state of gratitude, One, is, another one it calms you down, another one smelling it starts the digestive process, another one it takes the stress away which puts you more into that other side of being which is about rest, digest, repair which is what we want, we want more rest, we want more digestion, we want to repair and heal. So this is a really simple point. But ultimately, I think the more we learn about health and well-being, the more we understand that the mind and the body connection is everything. and actually can trump sometimes the mechanics of what we put in our mouth or what we avoid. You get the 90 and 100-year-old women, men, mostly women, that are supremely healthy and they smoke cigarettes or they drink alcohol every day or they don't eat that well and it's like well what are they doing okay they're saying prayers they're grateful for their life they're very calm people they don't stress out they don't overreact they never eat on the run so you start to piece this together and then you start to understand quantum physics quantum mechanics mind body medicine and we've interviewed many of them for this launch Dawson Church as well is speaking in the total wellness summit um, <clears throat> foodmatters.com forward slash TWS. Make sure to sign up and save your spot. And this is a big, big, big thing, mindful eating. And I think that even eating a poor diet with a very mindful approach, it would be interesting to study that. And I think that there could be some interesting outcomes. <clears throat> so, recapping, hydration, eliminating or removing modern grains as much as possible eating your fat and not drinking your fat, essentially is probably that third one. Fourth one is modern dairy is a bit full on, 
not ideal and we should be looking for alternatives there. And the fifth one is being mindful around the way that you approach your food and your plate. These five steps, I honestly believe, are the, the, the shortcut, the distillation to improving your health, improving your energy, improving your immunity, improving your longevity. And I think all of the experts that I've interviewed would agree deeply with what I'm saying. There might be some discussion around fat, there might be some micro discussions around dairy or fermentation or whatever. Ultimately, we're all on the same page here. And it is exciting, I think, for me at least, to feel there's a sense of clarity coming out of the confusion that is the modern dietary landscape. So, peace, love, blessings. What is the Clean 15? Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen is a list of foods that have the highest pesticide ratings and the list of foods that have the lowest pesticide ratings if they are non-organic. You can find that out on the EWG's working, the Environmental Working Group's website, EWG. Or go to foodmatters.com and just search Clean 15, you'll find something there. Thank you so much, guys. It's been wonderful to connect with you again. Uh, Nicole, first time here, welcome. And I'm excited for you to hear about this upcoming summit. And in the last interview on the last day, uh, I announced something new, a new project that's going to be coming out, a new film. So can't wait for that. And yeah, thank you so much for your support. This community, it just blows my mind every day. And, and just 15 years been working in this space, producing films and content for you, helping my dad heal. It's been such a journey for me. And I feel so honored and privileged to be a, a guide and a support and a communicator for this movement. And I acknowledge that it's not me. I'm standing on the shoulders of many giants and great researchers that have, um, been a part of the films that we've made and, and the, the summits that we bring to the world and and I just want to thank you so much for your support over the years as well if you watch Food Matters back in 2008 or you've just come to us for the first time welcome thank you and uh, have a beautiful day